Welcome to the Newsbeat Podcast, where we examine critical issues of social justice. Each episode features interviews with prominent writers, educators, thought leaders, and activists, and is infused with original music and verses from independent artists. The Newsbeat Podcast, the New York Times Podcast Club Pick of the Week in January 2018, and featured podcast on Best of the Left. Here's your host, Manny Faces. Hey, everybody. This is Manny Faces, producer and host of Newsbeat, where we weaponize journalism and music to tackle the most important social justice issues of our day. Thanks for joining us for another full episode. As always, Newsbeat is brought to you by Mori Creative Studios, an inbound marketing, sales enablement, and client retention platinum HubSpot partner agency. Check them out at moricreative.com and discover all the extraordinary things they can do for you and your business. Now, as we highlighted in our season one finale titled Why We Riot, Hundreds of rebellions broke out within cities and African-American communities across the United States in the summer of 1967 and in the immediate aftermath of the murder of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April 1968. This episode examines the latest update to the original so-called Kerner Report, an analysis by an 11-member commission established by President Lyndon B. Johnson to identify the causes of those 67 riots and propose recommendations for the future, answering three main questions what happened, why did it happen, and what could be done to prevent it from happening again. Led by then-governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner Jr., the commission published its voluminous findings just about a month before MLK's assassination, discovering that, surprise, surprise, the mass unrest resulted from frustrations within the African-American communities about the lack of economic opportunity, with its chief catalyst, white racism, contributing to, quote, pervasive discrimination in employment, education, and housing. It infamously and ominously concluded that unless drastic reforms were made, quote, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. MLK himself called the landmark report a physician's warning of approaching death with the prescription for life. This year is the Kerner Report's 50th anniversary. And in anticipation, new research was conducted and published, finding, essentially, that civil rights gains since that time have either stalled or even reversed, and highlighting America's sky-high child poverty rate, resegregation of schools, emboldened white supremacists, exploding mass incarceration, widening income and achievement gaps, and rampant voter suppression, among other disturbing truths. So basically, in a half a century since this initial probe identified many of these issues and cautioned against where we as a nation were headed while proposing viable, actionable remedies, things have gotten even worse. Well, perhaps all is not lost, not yet at least. Hope is a huge part of the solution and very much alive within the latest incarnation of the analysis titled Healing Our Divided Society, Investing in America 50 Years After the Kerner Report. Now, as in 1968, we need action. Weighing in on all of this for us is former U.S. Senator Fred Harris, the last surviving member of the 1968 Kerner Commission and co-editor of the new report. Racial and ethnic discrimination is worsening again. Dorothy Stoneman, the founder and former CEO of nonprofit Youth Build, who authored a chapter within the latest report. I think the same political will that the Kerner Commission called for in 1968 is something we need to develop now. And Reverend Michael McBride, founder and lead pastor of The Way Christian Center in West Berkeley, California, and director of Urban Strategies and the Live Free Campaign with nonprofit Pico National Network. It is almost as if black and brown poor folks in this country are a nuisance to the United States government rather than a responsibility that we all seem to own and care to uh, solve the worst conditions of our people. Our musical guest is hip hop artist and Newsbeat's artist in residence, Silent Night. All right, here we go. This is Kerner Report, 50 years later. America is even more separate and unequal. Frederick Douglass talked about this a hundred years ago. years ago. He said no one ever got their rights given to them on a platter. To them on a platter. You've got to fight for it. Got to fight for it. You've got to struggle for it. You've got to struggle for it. And that's what we're doing. We're protesting. We're protesting. We're protesting. And we're going to keep agitating. We're going to keep protesting until we get what is ours. Well, there were terrible riots, a lot of them. In the summer of 1967, in the black sections of 
so many American cities. And President Johnson appointed a Blue Ribbon Citizens Commission headed by Governor Otto Kerner. The commission will investigate the origins of the recent disorders in our cities. It will make recommendations to me, to the Congress, to the state governors, and to the mayors for measures to prevent or contain such disasters in the future. I was a member of the commission. The actual name of the commission was the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, came to be called the Kerner Commission. And he gave us, President Johnson did, a charge to look into the riots and the violent protests and to uh, not only, uh, incidentally, in regard to sort of their law and order standpoint, but also in regard to deeper causes. And that's what we did. He said, let your search be free, find the truth, and report it in, uh, and express it in your report. And that's exactly what we did. And our report, March the 1st, 19. 68 shocked the conscience of the country uh, and also disappointed President Johnson, I think. And what we've tried to do in this report is to let people see this thing through our eyes and to feel it in the pit of their stomachs like we do. And then if they see what a crisis this really is, what a terribly serious crisis this is for our country, I think there'd be a great deal more willingness to try to move to do uh, uh, something about it. When John Lindsay and I were going out for site visits ourselves, one of the places we went to was Milwaukee. I spent the morning in a black barber shop there and uh, talked to young black men coming in. Uh, they were virtually all from the South. They'd, they'd come to Milwaukee looking for jobs at just about the time jobs were disappearing or moving away. And the first question that I asked each one of them puzzled them, and I finally discovered why. And the question I asked was, do you find more uh, or less segregation here in Milwaukee than you uh, found in Birmingham or wherever you came from? And the reason they were puzzled was, I finally found out was, in Milwaukee, they didn't even see any white people. Well, for heaven's sake, we have a right to exercise our constitutional God-given right of free speech. That means protest, demonstration, whenever we want. We don't have to give any reasons for this. This is our constitutional right. And we have a right to get adequate and decent protection. Now, for heaven's sake, he had a white riot on the south side for the last two nights. And what did he call for? A voluntary curfew. He didn't have any voluntary curfew when a few blacks tore up part of 3rd Street. Well, that's a weekend. It was a, that's a double Muslims. standard of justice. Yeah, he called now, Muslims. What the hell do we call them out there throwing bricks and bottles at little kids and women, huh? Big well, heroes. The most famous line was, our nation is moving toward two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Discrimination and segregation have long permeated much of American life. They now threaten the future of every American. To pursue our present course will involve the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the destruction of basic democratic values. And then we said uh, straight out, the president had told us uh, to tell the truth and that's what we did. We said, what white people have never understood but the Negro, that's what we said in those days, but the Negro has always known is that these black ghettos were established by white racism and they're sustained by white racism. And we recommended then a vigorous enforcement of the newly passed civil rights laws, a desegregation of housing and schools, uh, and great new federal programs in regard to jobs and training and housing and education and so forth. We made really substantial progress on virtually every aspect of race and poverty for about a decade after the Kerner report. But then, particularly with the advent of the Reagan administration, that progress stopped. We began to cut taxes for the rich and, and for big corporations and cut programs for the benefit of middle class people and poor people. And also, the jobs began to disappear. They either moved away because of globalization or they disappeared altogether because of 
automation. Consequently, we, we wound up, for example, now, as we say, in Healing Our Divided Society, this new book, racial and ethnic discrimination is worsening again. Our cities and schools are resegregating. Inequality of income is worse than it was 50 years ago, and it's worsening still. And there are millions more poor people today than there were in those days. What we're trying to do with this book and with the promotion of it is to get race and poverty back on the national agenda, to let people understand, if they don't already, that racism and poverty are still with us, they're getting worse, and acting to do something about it is good for all of us. Here's a keynote for all my people. They say one nation indivisible, but that's the default. That's your sweet talk to keep us peaceful. You can't scrap the research cause you're not happy with the results. Meanwhile, it's all a recycle. Resegregation in neighborhoods and high schools. It's hard to think about FICO when you in fight mode. Or in survival mode You in the lifeboat Watching the yachts go by While well, well-to-do white folk With generational wealth Tell you they would just like you That tone deaf pep talk That colorblind pride That old bootstrap crap People abide by You got your whole wide world Saying you not wrong That two society prediction Wasn't far off It's all par for the cause All bark and ignore Let's all pardon any parts of the cause I think it's extremely important for us to look at what has happened and what hasn't happened and what should happen going forward. Right now, there are 4.9 million 16 to 24 year olds in the United States of America who are out of school and out of work. 41% of them were raised in poverty and live in low income households. They really are the young people who will birth and raise the next generation in poverty if our nation doesn't invest in opportunities for them. There's a widespread narrative, which is false, that it's too late to do anything for young people at that age, that you have to catch them in preschool or else they're doomed. What I have learned through 40 years of work in Youth Build is that the opposite is true, that when young people reach the age where they become young adults and they have the agency of making decisions about who they're going to be and what life are they going to live, they are more than ready to seize an opportunity to go back to school or to get job training or to serve their communities because by that time they have figured out that the path that they're on is gonna leave them nowhere. Many of them, uh, according to our research, which we did in 2002 with Brandeis University, uh, expect to be dead or in jail by the time they're 25 because they don't see any other options in front of them in their neighborhoods. There's a large unemployment rate, there's a large dropout rate. There are young people who have seen no option for making a living except to join gangs or to sell drugs and so they they feel completely lost and disconnected from society many of us believe that the recommendations of the kerner commission really outlined several things that are of critical concern number one it actually identified the white racism that is pervasive in the country and that needed to be solved largely by white people as one of the major important pieces to addressing the social unrest that was happening. After the addressing of the white racism, it would naturally lead to a massive investment into the neighborhoods that have been uh, systematically disinvested from and some would even say under attack by the state. Uh, for decades and maybe even centuries, particularly where large numbers of black folks, uh, brown folks, poor folks live. Our recommendations very much wanted to mirror the similar investments that were done by the United States in a massive rebuilding of Western Europe after World War II. Now, it's, it's worthy to note that the kind of carnage and the kind of destruction that the World Wars caused in parts of Europe required a international responsibility, particularly by those who were considered allies in the fight together uh, against the spread of uh, Hitler and many of the other, the axis of evil. And so many of us believe that that same kind of massive partnering and investment 
needed to be similarly done to large segments of the South, uh, large segments of the Midwest, large segments of California, where we saw large numbers of black folks and, and others fleeing because of the racialized terror that was a result of policing, Ku Klux Klan, racial vigilantes. And so for us, the Marshall Plan is a similar kind of effort that could be done in the United States, but we find the inability of the United States government to take on such a huge investment to be indicative of the United States, largely disinvestment and one could even say lack of concern as relates to the plight of large numbers of black folks living in this country. It is almost as if black and brown poor folks in this country are a nuisance to the United States government rather than a responsibility that we all seem to own and care to uh, solve the worst conditions of our people. And that for us is a uh, part of what we see with the uh, Kerner Commission some 50 years later. We have still not resolved the response that President Johnson had, which was to largely ignore the report because of its recommendations. We find that ignoring the report's recommendations to still be endemic uh, some 50 years later by largely progressive and certainly inclusive of conservative elected officials all across the country. One nation under attack, another under a pack. I let you guess which one is a higher number of black and brown folks in the mix. Or how about this? You don't need a guess. That information already exists now. 50 years after the fact, it's still the same shit. Either the racist or the complacent. Change the date, but the state still remains the same. Unless we take it in our hands and create change. We could fan the flames or we could douse them. I have a half century pass with the same outcome. If we about something, let's shut down these loud mouth clowns that's still wishing that the South won. Son, burning hand and burning man, some things got better. Others got even worse and damn, if white supremacy done got more bold again. They're closing in, so we gonna be more open then. One can make a totally uninterrupted connection between the riots and the unrest of the 60s and 70s and the opposite response that the government largely did as relates to the Kerner Commission to our communities that were largely the, the kind of source and the center of these recommendations. I mean, we have to continue to appreciate that the 70s saw the rise of the Black Panthers and many other expressions of self-determination. And the response was not massive investment, but the response was massive repression, criminalization. Nixon, rather than using the opportunity to uh, scale up what was commonly at that time a guaranteed basic income strategy, Nixon instead declared a war on drugs that was largely a war on black and brown and poor people. America's public enemy number one is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Uh, Reagan, rather than using the early uh, years of the 80s as an opportunity to try and heal and bring the country back together, Reagan invested uh, much of his political capital in a tax cut that literally drained the public sector of all of the resources necessary to uphold our communities. When I sign this bill into law, America will have the lowest marginal tax rates and the most modern tax code among major industrialized nations. One that encourages risk-taking, innovation, and that old American spirit of enterprise. And simultaneously, if we believe what Congresswoman Maxine Waters and others believe, our neighborhoods were flooded with drugs and crack cocaine and other forms of harmful drug uh, addiction realities that decimated our communities. And then right on the heels of that, the response of the federal government was not to bring a public health response to drug addiction, but it was to hire large numbers of police officers and double and triple the policing budgets in many of our communities. And so all of these factors taken together, I think, continue to demonstrate that uh, 50 years later, we see the errors, uh, the political errors, the leadership at the local, state and federal errors that were done. And, and the question we have is, will we learn?
uh, from these mistakes uh, some 50 years later? Will we actually begin to look back at the recommendations of these reports, look back at some of the solutions that were being thrown around during these times, like the guaranteed basic income and a guaranteed jobs bill, a massive investment into neighborhoods that have been systematically disinvested in? What would it look like to make sure banks that were redlining back in the 60s and 70s are held to a higher degree of penalty and accountability if they're continuing to redline? I think the same political will that the Kerner Commission called for in 1968 is something we need to develop now. We need to develop the consciousness of the desires of all people to be responsible contributing citizens, and we need to open the doors to all people to fulfill that vision. I think that black and white people have been separated from knowing each other over centuries in this country. That is happening now, and it was happening before. The Kerner Commission recommended the creation of two million public and private jobs for the young people who were out of school and out of work and lost in low-income communities. That wasn't done. We still recommend that that be done because we are wasting as a nation enormous talent and passion for creating a better society because we have believed that it's too late and it is right on time to come in with job and education and service and leadership opportunities for those two million young people who are 16 to 24, who were raised in poverty with little hope and who are eager for another chance. A historical reading of history and of the current events that we are facing would make us believe that the reason we have these problems in poor urban communities is because people living in poor and urban communities are just lazy or just have no desire to learn to improve their conditions, that they're just inherently violent or inherently morally deficient. We reject those assumptions and those assumptions persist. And so the, the role of government, of, of social society, of, of systems and structures is to overcompensate for these erroneous claims made upon poor black and brown and white folks that allow our conditions to be uh, caught in this in this kind of cycle of poverty of disinvestment and degradation our liberation is tied together so we have to figure out ways to address the concerns of all of us together not just the uh, very wealthy or very uh, affluent few uncle sam sitting on his deathbed with a bottle full of medicine right next to him Except it isn't even open, it's unsettling It's right there, it has instructions and everything And it's true, we're unequal and separate But we had a roadmap, we commend it If we man up and woman up and we center it Prioritize it and really render it It's a warning of death, but not imminent They don't wanna take the cure, so we live with it Or we all die, cognitive dissonance They swear they got equality, well this isn't it A society divided, but I have hope or maybe I'm naive and it's a bad joke But I'ma fight the good fight until the last note With the people and the love on my side The Newsbeat Podcast is owned by Newsbeat Inc. Visit us at usnewsbeat.com the producer and host of Newsbeat is Manny Faces. Our editor-in-chief is Christopher Taworski. Newsbeat's managing editor is Rashed Meehan. The executive producer of Newsbeat is Jed Morey. Our podcast and website are co-produced and managed by Morey Creative Studios. Newsbeat relies on listener support and grants. Artists that appear on the podcast are compensated for original material. To support Newsbeat or contribute to our Artist in Residence program, visit us at usnewsbeat.com and click on support. Subscribe to Newsbeat by Mori Creative Studios wherever you download your podcasts by searching for Newsbeat.